Ladies and gentlemen, we are live for the first ever clash of the craniums. Feels very gladiatorial with that intro. I like that. Uh, how you guys doing? Want to know uh, where you guys are watching the broadcast from? I'm physical therapist Shui McKay, also host of PT Pinecast. That's my day job. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this on uh, the Twitter, the Bird app, we want to know where you are tuning in from. So let's break out those uh, phalanges and let the uh, opposable thumbs do the talking. Just drop in the comments below whether you're on Twitter or on YouTube. Uh, where you're located. Let's go geographic first. Where are you located? You can also uh, chime in. Let us know where you are in your PT journey. I'm seeing some other uh, faculty. I'm seeing first-year students, second-year students, third-year students. We're seeing some athletic trainers, so not just physical therapy. We've got Izzy from UNLV. Wow, we're West Coast over there. I'm seeing a lot of Methodist students. You'll figure out why that is in just a little bit. There we go. As we start to work the comments section. Mike Pasco joining us from uh, Colorado Anschutz. Good. We like this. So we're getting ourselves a little bit of... Wow, the comments are coming in quick now. I can't read these. Hello, friends. Yes. Uh, coming in from all over. Fayetteville. Cleveland. That rocks. Chad from Cleveland State. First year from North Carolina. Ohio. Donnie from Utah. Will Smith from Missouri State. All right, so you got the idea. Uh, feel free to chat along in the comments section below. We are going to get underway in just a little bit. But first, I've got to bring out the reason that we're here. Uh, a few months ago, things start out with a tweet or an email, and that's how things work. Uh, got one from this guy right here. Let's welcome uh, to the screen professor from uh, Messis University, Matt Kondo. Matt, welcome to your show. Hey, Jimmy. How are you? I'm doing well. This is a thing, man. It is a thing. All right. It, so we're doing Clash of the Craniums. This is kind of your brainchild. I'll bring the, the roaring applause down. Uh, just real quick before we get started, why are we doing this? What, what, what about anatomy and trivia? Why are we putting these two things together? Well, you know, honestly, my, my soft spot, my guilty pleasure has always been game shows. I'm an absolute mm -hmm. game show junkie. And, you know, I also listen to an anatomy education podcast. And over in the UK, they run anatomy trivia nights all the time, right? So they run them on campus. They run them in pubs. They run them all over the place. And I, I started asking around here in the U.S. I'm like, who's doing this here? And really nobody was doing one. I said, well, then I'm going to start one. So I started, you know, contacted you, contacted some students, got some ideas. And I said, this would be a great year to run it virtually. Okay. So that way, you know, all the students that didn't get to meet each other in places like CSM could kind of come together in a centralized location and have some fun. All right. I like it. So you've got every, all the elements. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it's BYOB wherever I'm located because that's how we're working these days. Uh, we've got more than 100 of you ready to play. And if you're not familiar with Kahoot, there are two ways people can log on, right? One is the Kahoot app. We're going to give you the code. And the second is just opening up a, a window, a browser window, either on your phone. It works best on your phone. So if you're watching this on a laptop or something like that, break out your uh, your your phone. And here is the Kahoot code for round number one. So again, you're going to go to Kahoot.it and you're going to type in that code, which is on the screen right now. Super secret code that is 728-7290. Kahoot.it 728-7290. Zero, as we're seeing people start to chime in. Good. So we've got more than 130 of you. Wow. This quickly became a thing, Matt. Quickly became a thing. I had all the faith in the world of PT students, Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, PT students, wasn't that long ago I was a PT student, fired up, ready to do stuff like this. And I can't imagine right now, in this world that we live in, just dying for some interaction. And I apparently we're looking at you guys as we've got more than 90 people logged on right now. That's pretty quick. Uh, this is a thing. So uh, again, Kahoot.it and that game pin 728-7290. And uh, we're letting people know we're going to have four rounds of 10. And we'll have individual round winners, right? Based on points. Correct answer is going to get you points. Incorrect, no points. But also, the faster you answer, the more points you get. So speed is rewarded. I will have you know, speed not rewarded on the NPTE. So don't don't get all racy on that, okay? Uh, as we got more than 155 of you chiming in, why don't we give them 30 more seconds, Matt? 
and then we will get to go. Um, any advice as the students are uh, are getting set for this? You put the questions together. That's why they know they're legit. I'm just going to stand here and read them. You know, my, my advice to the students would be crack the fingers, crack the knuckles, get everything ready to go, and have fun. Have fun. This is not an exam. Just go for it. All right. Let's give them 10 more seconds, and then we will start the first ever clash of the craniums. Five, four, three, two, one. Matt, go ahead and click start. And we are underway. Make sure you check out uh, the screen for the question and your signaling device, whether that's a tab or your phone. First question up, which motion does the nerve that is located on the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane of the tibia control? And Matthew, well-placed picture of the sumo wrestler there. Which motion does the nerve that is located on the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane of the tibia control? Eversion, dorsiflexion, Flexion of the great toe or abduction of toes two through four. Lock in your answers. The faster you answer, the more points you get. If you are correct, if we come to the end of question number one, we have that make that warms the cockles of my heart. Cockles, not actual location on your heart, but 132 of you getting that correct. Well done. That's pretty good. So talk about that. Which motion is the nerve that is located on the anterior surface of the interosseous membrane of the tibia control? What is that nerve we're talking about, Matt? Well, that's going to be the deep fibular nerve or deep peroneal nerve, depending on if you like the Latin version or the Greek version. I prefer the Latin version. We're going very multicultural here today. Did you well, think we'd be mixing trivia and learning? I did. Well, trivia, learning, and anatomy, right? I mean, what a perfect trio. All right. So 132, already off to a, to a pretty good start. Let's move on. Checking in the, uh, the scoreboard. Wow. And uh, some people were very, very quick. Srathburn appearing to be in the lead right now. Let's keep going. Question number two, which of the following muscles is not part of the pes and serenus? Uh, also known as the goose's foot, the pes and serenus. Is it the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, gracilis, or sartorius? Which of the following muscles is not part of the pes and serenus. Focus on those knots because that could confuse you. Remember taking NPTE prep tests and getting tripped up on those. Not. This is a not question. Lock in your answers. And there we go. I'm feeling rather intimidated. We, we have 78. A majority got this one correct. Uh, pes and serene. Matt, talk about that just for a second. Goose's foot. Where? Just briefly, where is it located? Why is it important? Why should we... Well, remember where the goose's foot is going to be. It's going to be on the medial side of the knee. And what I always tell my students is that that's really where the medial compartment, the anterior compartment, and the posterior compartment of your thigh come together. So lots of innervations, lots of actions, lots of function. Plus, it's fun to say goose's foot. Let's uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well done. You, is that you? Are you a lead? Are you playing along? No, I'm not playing lead. Someone has I'm, impersonated me. Someone is spoofing you, and I like their style. <laughs> I like that. Let's go next. Question number three, which nerve pierces the coracobrachialis muscle? Which nerve pierces the coracobrachialis muscle? I like the use of the thinker there. Is it musculocutaneous nerve, brachial nerve, median nerve, or the ulnar nerve as you lock in your answer choices? Which nerve pierces the coracobrachialis muscle with five seconds left to go? One hundred and twenty of you are correct. See, I'm liking the fact that like we're having a majority. Very confident there. And what was that? We we skipped ahead a little fast. What was the answer there? Coracobrachialis. So the answer was the musculocutaneous nerve pierces coracobrachialis. And I agree. I think it's fantastic to see the vast majority answering correctly on these. Like it. All right, Doctor Kondo <laughs> still in the lead. Not Matt, but a different Doctor Kondo apparently. Get, that's scary that there's two out there. It happens. Uh, let's move on to the next question. All right, question four. Which of the following arteries? We're going to go blood supply. Which of the following arteries supplies blood to the gallbladder? Which one? Is it the splenic, 
Is it the cystic? Is it the proper hepatic? Or is it the right gastric? Which of the following arteries supplies blood to the gallbladder? Lock in your answer choices, as more 90 of you already have. Another professor giving us some kudos there. Mike Pasco from Colorado Anschutz saying, nice job. With three seconds left, lock in your answer choice. And the artery supply, cystic is correct. This one a little more sp spread out. But you'll find that as you prepare for the NPTE. Some things you'll be better at. Some things you're worse. And that's don't okay. Be, Blood supply is really, worse. really important. All right. So it is cystic. Uh, pretty pretty evenly spread out. A majority did have that correct. But also some people guessing incorrect. Let's see who, how the, uh, the, the, the board has moved. Hannah G moves into first place as uh, Dr. Kondo falls off. The I'm disappointed in myself. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question here. Halfway through round one after this question, which of the following hamstring muscles is innervated by the common fibular branch of the sciatic nerve? Which of the following hamstring muscles is innervated by the common fibular branch of the sciatic nerve? Is it the long head of the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, short head of the biceps femoris, or semimembranosus? What do you think it is? Innervated by the common fibular branch of the sciatic nerve. I like the pictures because I never know. Are they throwing me off or are they trying to give me a hint? I think this one is just there because it shows the hamstrings. And what do we think? That is right. Short head of biceps femoris with a majority getting that right. But here's what I also like. Of those that got it wrong, you at least had biceps femoris. You were close. You were very close with 43 of you guessing the long head. It was the short head that is innervated by the common fibular branch of the sciatic nerve. As the leaderboard changes, ZP1127 moves ahead with more than 4,000 points as we are halfway through round one. All right, question six. Ooh, what does the Latin word teres mean? What does the Latin word teres mean? Is it is it flat? Is it long? Is it short? Is it round? I have been described as several of those. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Short and round for me, usually. What does the Latin word teres mean? You know this. There's a minor and a major. What do you think teres mean? I'll be honest. Studying Latin, great move if you're going to go into anything with health related. It just makes sense. All right. Lock in those answers. Teres means round. Wow. So many people thought flat. Mike Pasco, very excited about the use of Latin in this trivia. That really changed things up as BB and IC money move into the gold and silver spots here as we're more than halfway through round number one. Going for the golden femur. We're going to break out that trophy and show that off in a little bit. Do we have that in the room there, man? Was that close? I, I don't have it in the room. It's in my garage currently. So, sorry. Well, All right. Which we'll of the following it. muscles has two heads? Two heads. Which one? Is it adductor halysis? Is it abductor digiti minimi? Is it flexor halysis longus or is it quadratus plantae? Two heads. Which one? You guys are really challenging my Latin. I feel really bad if I just start mispronouncing stuff and get called out by students in the chat. That's what will happen. All right, lock in those answer choices. Yeah, two heads. A majority of you got that. Well done. It is adductor halysis. Two heads. Why is that important, Matt? Why is it important to know that? Well, it's important to know that because if we have a patient that comes in with, say, with pain across the plantar surface of the metatarsals or pain that sometimes gets misdiagnosed as plantar fasciitis, it's important to know how you can test for a specific uh, function or a specific diagnosis by simply having that patient adduct or adduct their great toe. You can really confirm a lot of things. Yeah, I like that. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right. A compromise of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus would present as which of the following? A compromise of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus would present as which of the following? Is it elbow flexion? Is it pronation? Is it shoulder abduction? Or is it elbow extension? A compromise of the posterior cord. I can see you all drawing in your minds. Elbow flexion, pronation, shoulder abduction, or is it elbow extension? And the answer right there, you guys not not fooled by that one at all. Getting that in elbow extension. 
Well done. Let's take a look at the board. Let's not move on to the next question just yet. We're getting uh, in the chat. I'm seeing some people saying the timing's off uh, between the Kahoot that you're seeing and on your uh, your signaling device. If you're watching on YouTube, that should be better. Although we have more than 130 people, that could be causing a little bit of lag. So we do apologize for that. And we'll try to correct it. We'll try to correct that. Golden Millie. I, like, I do like seeing the random screen names. I do like that. All right, so we're going to try to con we're trying to fix that lag just a little bit. So bear with us. Let's move on to the next uh, next question. All right, which of the following arteries does the suprascapular artery? Say that for me, Matt. You're going to anastomose. Use... I knew what it was anastomose with. We... <laughs> a long day. I'm just going to drink for a minute. You see the question on the screen, everybody. You're smart. All right, is that dorsal scapular? Yep. Is it circumflex, scapular? Is it thoracodorsal or lateral thoracic? I do like the the Kahoot names. It is it is an art. Super scapular. Super. I can't do it. All right. Hey. Well. Well done. Circumflex scapular. Uh, dorsal scapular was the uh, next uh, most popular, but incorrect answer. So circumflex scapular arteries. Hey, I'm proud That's of them. Cool. That's a rough question. Not easy. Not easy. All right, let's move on here. CP moves up. We've got Preston, AWAM, and AA Ron rounding out the top five. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Last question in round number one, a fracture to the middle third of the clavicle would potentially affect which blood vessel a fracture to the middle third of the clavicle would potentially affect which blood vessel subclavian brachiocephalic axillary or brachial what do you think it is subclavian brachiocephalic axillary or brachial lock in your answer choices And yes, almost a clean sweep there would be would be very nice to see us wipe the board and have a good one. But axillary was correct there. 135 out of you uh, getting that correct. So congratulations. Let's take a look at the round number one. The bronze medal is Preston with 6,100 points. A-W-A-M. 6,400 points in first. ZP, 1127. A. Aaron and Golden Millie just off of the platform. Now, that's well done. Matt, what what did you think of that? I thought the scores were a lot higher than I would have expected. Not that I was doubting the students, but that was pretty good. I am impressed with everybody so you know what round one tells me is that everybody has been studying everybody remembers their anatomy and every anatomy instructor is right on point so all around great job all right so i will tell you this since we're in the middle of this live broadcast if you are seeing some lag refresh your screen right now we're not going to start round two for another 60 seconds or so so give that a refresh that is the best option we have right now to try to help that lag because there's how many of these how many people are actually watching live so get ahead and refresh we'll take another 45 seconds before we start with round number two while we're waiting uh we'll let people know oh we've got we've actually got an online conference so we're doing uh we're doing a uh online anatomy trivia right now we've got a a virtual conference coming up tomorrow specifically in the world of physical therapy uh oncology physical therapy so people were asking for it through the podcast. It's a, a little, it's a thriving area in the profession. So it is called the Virtual uh, Oncology Physical Therapy Conference. You can find out more right now at ptpinecast.com. We do have student pricing too. We didn't want to price students out. So I think we gave you like a 60% off uh, discount if you can prove you're a student. So fire away if treating people uh, living with a cancer diagnosis is something you might want to do in your profession. We've got about 13 speakers lined up across the board from uh, the uh, American Physical Therapy Association oncology section uh, across the uh, profession. And uh, you're going to have also 365 replay, 365 day replay access. So you buy your ticket uh, for tomorrow's live event. 
you're still going to be able to access it uh, coming up for the next year. So as we go for round number two, it will be a different Kahoot code, as you can see on the screen. Again, Kahoot.it with a brand new game pin. It's 413-9420. That is 413. I'll type it in the chat. 413-9420. Now, what's going to be interesting here, Jimmy, is how many people change their name for round two. Mm, I would change my name. I would try to get now that I know that people are being creative. Fool's nerve. I'm seeing you. All right, I had more than 130 playing last time, so we'll give it a minute. Let me get back to that. Hopefully, let us know if you are experiencing that lag again. Because, Matt, our goal is long term. Do this on a semi-regular basis. That's the goal. The goal is that on a regular interval, we're going to run these just like you would run a regular trivia night at a local pub. So if we're not getting it perfect, let us know. And we'll make sure we can... I'll figure it out somehow. I'll just bang on the computer a little bit. We'll just, we'll just hit it a few times. All right. Wow. Apparently, we've picked up a few people since last round. We're across 147 um, competitors. We'll give it another 20 seconds before we start round number two. Okay. And before we start anything, Jimmy, I do have a request for a dad joke. So, dad joke. Feel free. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to tell a joke about the Suez Canal, but that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have better than that. Oh, well, that's usually how my jokes go. Yeah. You know, literally, one of my students said, You know what I love about your anatomy class? You always start with a terrible joke. And I'm like, Thanks. Wow. <laughs> It's a quick way to lose 10 points on a quiz. All right. We're across 156 participants. Uh, I feel like we're waiting for popcorn to pop. I'm pretty sure that's right. it. 155. Here we go. We're going to rip right there. And round number two. Let's do this thing. Cra Clash of the Cranium is round number two out of four. And here we go. First question up. Which of the following is a valid neurological test for the femoral nerve? Which of the following is a valid neurological test for the femoral nerve? Is it the patellar tendon reflex? Is it hip adduction, knee flexion, or hip abduction? Which of the following is a valid neurological test for the femoral nerve? Uh, the faster you lock in the correct answer, the more points you will get as we have less than six seconds to go. Patellar tendon reflex, hip adduction, knee flexion, or hip abduction? What do you think it is as we take a look at the answer choices? And a majority knowing that patellar tendon reflex is the valid neurological test for that femoral nerve. This one smells like an MPTE question or some something could have come from this. Oh, absolutely, Jimmy. Absolutely. All right. Let's see how we move on here. It's going to be a okay coming in <laughs> right now. G Money, leader in the clubhouse right out of the gate. Let's go to question two in round two. And here we are. Which of the following ligaments would most likely uh, uh, be affected with an inversion ankle sprain? Which of the following ligaments would be most likely affected with an inversion ankle sprain? Some early answers already locked in. Is it calcaneofibular, deltoid, long plantar, or dorsal talonavicular? What do you think it is? Lock in your answer choices. Do we get a different dad joke every round? I think that would be appropriate. I can definitely do a different dad joke every round. Wow, more than 100 of you out of 155. Calcaneal fibular, the ligament most likely to be affected with an inversion ankle sprain. Very good. I said overall, I am super impressed with PT students. Four J's in the three spot. ZP 1127 back on the board. And Humdinger Squirts coming across at 1656, leading after two questions. All right. Question three. The somatic sensations of the inferior border of the buttock would follow which sensory pattern? Somatic sensations of the inferior border of the buttock would follow which sensory pathway? Is it S2? L5, S1, or S3? It's the best part, like in anatomy tests. I remember back in PT school, like just classmates standing up and like touching themselves in the middle of the test. Totally normal in PT school. No one even bats an eye. Our last exam looked like a really bad game of Twister. It was awful. All right, locking those answer choices. And what do we think? Yes, 
Wow, this one evenly spread. Look at that inverse bell curve we've got there. 52 of you getting it right. Very close from S2 to S3, but inferior border of the buttock. Uh, what's the easiest way to remember this one, Matt? So the easiest way to remember the dermatomes is actually have the patient bend over, and literally the dermatomes follow from cephalad or head all the way down to the butt. And that makes yeah. it a lot easier to remember that way. Dermatomes don't make any sense until the person bends over and puts their hands out. That's exactly right. And it makes complete sense right there. All right. So 52 of you got it right. As we change scores there, Chad coming in first, Sartorius and Xena round up the top three. All right. Question number four, an IV placed on the dorsum of the hand has the potential to affect which of the following nerves? IV on the dorsum of the hand, potential to affect which of the following nerves? Is it deep branch of the radial nerve, superficial branch of the radial nerve, deep branch of the ulnar nerve, or superficial branch of the ulnar nerve? As we get a lot of questions locked in. With five seconds remaining in this one, dorsum of the hand, following nerve, affected which that is right a majority a good majority there we're firing back here 107 of you knew that it was the superficial branch of the radial nerve the best part about something like this matt even if you get it wrong you're kind of like all right now i know what i need to look to work on that's exactly right and you know for at least the students at our university they had a lot of this material last semester so it's been a good six months since we covered the hand okay Perfect. All right, let's check out that uh, the leaderboard. I just wanted to check in on the lag to see if we fixed that. Did refreshing the uh, the browser help? Let us know. We want to make sure we get this thing right. Uh, just below 3,000 points, Sartorius, that Taylor's muscle coming in first. Chad K and Zena round out the podium. All right. Here we go. Question five out of 10 in round number two. A patient has cancer of the head of the pancreas. Pain would be referred to which of the following dermatomes? Patient has cancer of the head of the pancreas. Pain would be referred to which of the following dermatomes? Is it T5 through 9, T1 through 4, T11, and T12? What do you think it is? Less than three to go. And then it's correct. A uh, good majority there. T5 through 9. A lot of those pain referral patterns uh, questions, I remember those from practice tests and thinking, oh, yeah, I need to know this stuff. Chad K taking the lead. Zena Sartoria is still running up chop uh, three here. Jonathan uh, ties and uh, hashtag winning in the top handful. Let's move on here as we pass the midway point of round number two. Uh, which clinical sign would be most likely with an injury to the ulnar nerve at the medial epicondyle? What do you think? Which clinical sign would be most likely with an injury to the ulnar nerve at the medial epicondyle? Is it weak inflection of the wrist? Weak inflection of digits one and two? Is it paresthesia of the thumb or weakened pro? nation three seconds left lock in your answer choices here on question number six and looks like 87 of you knew that a clinical sign with an injury to the ulnar nerve of the medial epicondyle will be weakened flexion of the wrist walk us through this one matt so let's remember that not just the median nerve is going to help with the wrist flexors, but the ulnar nerve is going to innervate muscles like flexor carpi ulnaris, which is going to help with flexion of the wrist. Good to remember. And we have a bonus dad joke from the audience. A woodpecker flies into a bar and says, is the bar tender here? Very, very, very well done. I like that. Oh, that's amazing. Well done. Well done. You gotta, you gotta appreciate a good dad joke. All right, let's move on to the next question. We take a look at the scoreboard there. Zena climbing the charts. Jonathan, Sartorius, Preston, and Allie round out the top five. I love to share a good dad joke. Feel free. Uh, question seven out of ten in round number two. An injury to the which of the following cranial nerves is most likely to result in sensitivity to sound? What do we think? Sensitivity to sound, cranial nerve, go there. Is it accessory, 
Cranio 11. Vegas, 10. Lasso Pharyngeal is at 9. Or Facial, 7. What do you think it is? Cranial nerve most likely to result in sensitivity to sound. Lock in your answer choices. And yes, we've got 76 of you correctly identifying facial nerve. Uh, why were people, why, why might people get this one wrong? Why is it facial nerve? Where, where do we go there? What's your thought process? So, so the thought process is facial nerve is going to have some sensory innervation for reception of sound. So if you look at your other answer choices here, you know, vagus nerve is going to be your parasympathetic nervous system. Accessory nerve obviously innervates muscles like your um, upper trapezius and glossopharyngeal. You know, my students are going to get a kick out of this because I always say it says what it is, is what it says. It's the nerve that innervates the tongue and the pharynx. That's it. That's all it is. It is what it says. It says what it is. I like that. Absolutely. Uh, let's move on and see how the uh, the scoreboard is looking as Danielle gives us a bonus dad joke. Did you hear the rumor about butter? Well, I'm not spreading it. Oh. <laughs> Mike Pasco also chiming in. Have you heard about the quarter pillows? They're making headlines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's Come getting the anatomy deep. trivia. Stay for the dad jokes as we move on. Zena still on top, breaking the 5,000 point <laughs> barrier as we go to the next question. All right, number eight out of 10 in round number two. Neurons that control skeletal muscles have cell bodies for these neurons located in the blank. Neurons that control skeletal muscles have cell bodies for these neurons. They're located in the dorsal horn, dorsal root, ventral horn, or ventral root. What do you think? Lock in your answer choices with 10 seconds left. Love the Bobby Brown meme. Use that three, four times a week. That it gift. really fit here. Use your head, you right? And there we go. Neurons that control skeletal muscles have cell bodies for these neurons located in the ventral horn. Why should why why should someone just snap right to that, man? Well, let's think about it. If your um your nerves that control skeletal muscle all your motor function that comes from your ventral horn or your spinal cord all the dorsal horn um, or dorsal section of the spinal cord that's going to be more mostly your afferent or sensory nerve so really super important when you are evaluating your patients if you have a patient that has all motor deficits but no sensory deficit you should automatically think whoa this person may have a ventral root or ventral horn or ventral side of the spinal cord injury as opposed to the dorsal Perfect. All right. 71 of you getting that correct. We want to make sure we knew that. And uh, Preston Pterodactyl and King Timmy 7 with A.A. Ron and the Odd Facet round out the top five. Some really, really good Kahoot names in this round. Appreciating that as we go on to question nine out of 10 in round number two. What artery is most at risk from an ulcer that has perforated the posterior superior part of the pyloric canal what are artery, artery most at risk from an ulcer that has perforated the posterior superior superior part of the pyloric canal is it right gastric is it left gastric is it gastro duodenal or gastro duodenal what do you think it is lock in your answer choices with three seconds left now people are sharing more dad jokes in there. All right, <laughs> this one's spread across the board. Walk us through this one, Matt. Ooh, so let's let's remember what the right gastric is going to do and what the left gastric is going to do. So the left gastric artery is going to give off a, a little branch that's going to hit the posterior superior part of the pyloric canal. Remember where the pyloric canal and pyloric sphincter is? It comes right off the inferior aspect of the stomach, which is going to actually be on the lesser curvature of the stomach. So the left gastric artery is going to be the correct answer there. Left gastric. That was a tough one. All right. But that was a tough telling, one. You, telling you what you need to study. That's, that's perfect. All right. Move on to the next question. This won't be the uh, pronunciation doesn't count anatomy. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mike. We've also had two drinks. <laughs> Actually, though, the more the more I drink, the, the smarter this sounds. Uh, we've got pressed at the top of the leaderboard. Pterodactyl AA Ron ZP1127 still hanging in there. And King Timmy 7. As we go to the final question. Herniation of the C5, C6 intervertebral disc would most likely present as which impairment? 
in a uh, herniation of C5-6 intervertebral disc, most likely present as elbow flexion and thumb opposition, shoulder abduction and elbow flexion, shoulder abduction and wrist adduction, or shoulder abduction and shoulder elevation. Which impairments would it most likely look like? C5 and C6 intervertebral disc presenting as, let's go to the answer choice, 74 of you coming home. Man, students are paying attention. They're doing a great job, Jimmy. They're, I am so impressed with everybody. All right, walk through the behind the scenes, the replay on this one. C5-6 intervertebral disc. Well, remember that even though we have seven cervical vertebrae, we have eight cervical nerves. So we have a C0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and then we have T1 more inferior to that. So a intervertebral disc herniation at C5, C6, if you count down, that's going to be the nerve that's going to hit shoulder abduction. That's going to hit elbow flexion because that's going to be mostly C5. Nope, I'm sorry. That's going to be C6. Perfect. All right. So shoulder abduction and elbow flexion, the answer is 74 of you getting that right. Yeah. Great job. All We're right. The final question. Oh, oh, that, was, I think that, yeah, was, that was number 10. Right, that was number 10. Aaron. Pterodactyl with the silver. And with 10 out of 10, answering quickly as well, Preston. Clash of the Craniums, round two. Out of four tonight, we're going to have individual round winners as well as an overall champion. We're going to, add, we're going to take a deep dive into all your points from all the different rounds. As we get some people uh, in the uh, the chat as well. How's it going so far? Love to hear from you guys how you think it's going. Uh, we know the lag might be uh, still sticking around for some of you. We'll be working on that as we progress through these. People are very excited about Aaron doing that well. I think we're some, seeing some uh, some more people join as well. So I'm always just curious and confused on where you guys are from and how you found out about this. The word kind of spread. Uh, Matt, you were sharing this with program directors, anatomy professors, student groups. I shared this with a lot of folks. So so I sent emails out to every program director across the country. I sent uh, emails out um, to a lot of our alumni, a lot of our clinical instructors. And, you know, obviously you did a great job with promoting it on Twitter. Um, and, you know, I have to say I am just thrilled with the turnout. And, you know, like you've said several times, this is the first time we've done this. The next time we want it bigger and better. You always remember your first time, Matt. A lot of apologizing Absolutely. during your first time as well. I don't know if that was for oh, Never mind. We're talking about something else. All right. Let's go to round number three in the Clash of the Craniums here. All right. All right. It's going to be a different Kahoot code again. That Kahoot code on the screen, 528-8530, as we'll put that in the chat as well for you. Kahoot.it, or if you're using with uh, joining with the Kahoot app as well, that's 528-8530. Bragging rights on the line as well, I'm assuming, in class, yeah, amongst students in the same school. Uh, more than 130 last round. See, we uh, get up there again. The fleet enema. That's a good one. Oh, wow! That's there's a joke there, Jimmy. But I don't know. I don't know if I want to say it. Who dental power? I mean, how do you not just? I mean, you gotta give them credit. They're funny. Oh, absolutely. Here we go. All right. So we got more than 136 of you as we start to slow down a little bit. Let's get five more seconds. Four, three, two, and let's begin round number three out of four. Oh, we're going to be on round number four right now. All right. We'll do four and we'll come back to three. So okay. No worries. All right. Question number one. Here we go. Which nerve innervates the mus muscles of facial expression? Another muscle innervation question. Is it the trigeminal nerve? That's cranial nerve five. Is it facial nerve? Cranial nerve seven. Abducens six or ocular motor 
Kramer three. Lock in those answer choices. This one's going fast. You guys were right on top of this one. I think they're getting better and quicker. Yeah. They're knocking this up. All right, lock in your answer choices. That is correct. A lot of you getting that one. Nobody fooled by abducens. No one wanted to touch that one with a with a 10-foot stick. Uh, facial nerve, facial expression. Do you, I, mean, I think a lot of people who probably just guessed something different were probably thinking it can't be that obvious. But it is. Facial nerve, facial expression. It really is. And you remember that you know the muscles of facial expression are innervated by the facial nerve. The muscles of mastication or chewing, those are going to be innervated by the mandibular branch or V3 of the trigeminal nerve. All right. Checking the scoreboard here. Quadruple J, A. A. Ron, Joe Jack, G Money, and Hannah G. Round out our top five. Question number two. In round number three. Which of the following muscles has a distal attachment on the second rib? Think about this. Picture it. Which of the following muscles has a distal attachment on the second rib? Is it anterior scalene, middle scalene, posterior scalene? scalene or inferior scalene what do you think it is five seconds left to lock in your answer choices more than 140 of you in there now and let's find out what you got wow this one difficult all right we're seeing uh answers spread across the board let's stop it down here we don't want to move on too fast uh walk us through this one following muscles distal attachment on the second rib walk us through this Matt. so anterior scalene and middle scalene have a distal attachment on the first rib Posterior scalene is going to have a distal attachment on the second rib. And that's really important to know with your patients that have a rib resection surgery, if they have thoracic outlet syndrome or a, another or similar injury. Inferior scalene is not a muscle, that's, so that should not be say, an option. I was like, hey, I was like, is the inferior, and I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to sound stupid, but now I feel stupid for not calling it out faster. No, you're good. You're good. There we go. We're, we're all, right, all learning so here. Posterior scalene. Uh, before we go to the uh, we get we get the uh, the board. Before we go to the next question, we do have another uh, dad joke. Did you hear about the mathematician with really sore leg muscles? He worked out the quadratic equation. Oh wow! I can do a proper dad joke without the rim shot. All right, uh, quadruple J still in the lead by a couple hundred points there. Chad K, not Bianca B, not Matt M, and Sir Arley, all in there. All right, let's check out the next question in round number three. Which of the following muscles has an innervation that branches off of the ansa cervicalis? Which of the following muscles has an innervation that branches off the ansa cervicalis? Is it levator scap? Is it supraclavicular? Is it phrenic or sternohyoid? What do you think it is? Lock in those answer choices. Mike saying he just had a first rib dysfunction last week. Good thing when you marry within the profession. Someone's always there. Mika Mitchell dropping by. Hi, Mika. All right. Lock in those answer choices now. And what do we think? Sternohyoid coming in first. Uh, a decent number of people picking uh, Levator Scap. Walk us through this one, Matt. So let's remember our answer cervicalis is part of the cervical plexus. Okay. So there's four branches that come off the answer cervicalis. It's going to be sternothyroid, sternohyoid, inferior um, omohyoid, and superior omohyoid. All right. Let's check that leaderboard now. Quadruple J stays atop the leaderboard. Sir Arley, not Bianca B, Nacho, and not Matt M. As we go to question four in round number three, and here's that question. Which of the following ligaments is not present in the lumbar spine? Which of the following ligaments not present in the lumbar spine? Is it anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, Superspinous ligament or the ligamentum flavum. The first time I read that, I was like, this can't be real. Is this a real thing? It is. It's a real thing. Two Three. seconds left. Lock in those answer choices. Following ligaments not present in the lumbar spine. Ligamentum flavum. 
Talk us through this one. So lig ligament and flavum literally means yellow ligament. Okay, so it terminates in the lower thoracic spine. Really super important because it calcifies as we age. So there's a lot of times that patients will come in with thoracic pain and they actually have upper motor neuron signs because ligament and flavum calcifies and it presses against their spinal cord. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, ligaments and flavum. All right, yeah. the other ligaments. I feel like the, uh, the the first two were pretty much red herrings, right? Anterior longitude, no posterior longitude. Well, those were those were kind of gimmies. Got it. Uh, ligaments and flavum. Thoracic spine only calcifies as we age. Let's go okay. to the next uh, next set. And after we take a look at the leaderboard, as things shift, quadruple J is still atop. Nacho, Janae, Brienne, and Tosis rounding out the top five. Ligamentum flavor. Torticollis is a spasm of what muscle? Is it sternothyroid? Is it sternocleidomastoid? Is it sternohyoid or omohyoid? Torticollis. Good stock image there of torticollis. You like that? I do. Torticollis. So a lot of torticollis is a pediatric PT. It was great. I like torticollis because what you really did was you worked with the parents a lot. You're like, it's going to be fine. We're going to work it out. Yeah. SCM, sternocleidomastoid uh, for torticollis. That a good one. We almost swept that one. We almost got everybody on board getting SCM for torticollis. Spasm of that uh, of that muscle. What do you want to say about torticollis? Anything you want to throw in there? Not really anything much. You know, just remember sternocleidomastoid is, you know, one that says what it is, is what it says muscles. You know, if you ever have a trouble thinking about where the attachments are of sterocleidomastoid, it's in the name, right? It's baked in. All right, let's check out that leaderboard. Quadruple J, Nacho, still uh, on the top of the leaderboard, above 4,000. Janae, Tosis, and Dr. P. Nika Mitchell excited I'm mentioning some pediatric stuff. There we go. All right, next question up in round three out of four. Question six. A man was kicked in the posterior aspect of the knee. And the injury resulted in foot drop. What structure was damaged? All right, man kicked in the posterior aspect of a knee. Injury resulted in foot drop. There's a target there. Structure was damaged. What do you think? Uh, superficial fibular, tibial nerve, femoral nerve, or deep fibular nerve. Kicked in the posterior aspect of the knee. Foot drop. There's some clues. What structure was damaged? What do you think as you lock in your answer choices with five seconds left? And let's see what we got here. 75 of you knew that. Deep fibular nerve. A kick. There's, I feel like there's a couple uh, clues that you baked into that one, Matt. A kick, posterior aspect, and foot drop. Walk us through it. So let's remember that the anterior compartment of the lower leg is going to be all innervated by the deep fibular nerve or the deep peroneal nerve. So superficial fibular nerve is going to hit your lateral compartment. Those are going to be your everters of your ankle. Tibial nerve is going to stay in the posterior compartment. That's going to be your plantar flexors. Femoral nerve should not have been, been an issue because the femoral nerve is going to terminate in the quadriceps. All right. Deep fibular foot drop posterior aspect of the knee. Uh, that was question number six. Let's take a look at the leaderboard as we are uh, pretty much uh, more than three quarters or almost three quarters of the way through uh, round number three. Quadruple J. Very strong. Janae, Gen Y, Tosis, and Bohica round up the top five. Question seven. Up now. A patient displays a weak dorsalis pedis pulse, which of the following arteries is most likely occluded. What do you think? Weak dorsalis pedis posterior tibial artery, lateral plantar artery, anterior tibial artery, or medial plantar artery. A lot of answers coming in quick. Another blood supply question. Let's see how we do on this one. Stephen Lesh commenting here. Common ice hockey injury. Yes, yes. And let's see what we got here. 102 of you getting that one correct. Dorsalis pedis. Why is that a common ice hockey injury? Talk us through this. It could be a common ice hockey injury simply because how the skates tie up and they have to tie up very, very tightly on the lower leg, and just uh, superior to the ankle. So a lot of times what can happen 
through moving around and because your ankle is so fixed, um, you can actually have compression around the anterior compartment, which will then compress the anterior tibial artery. Anterior tibial artery, weak dorsalis pedis pulse. 102 of you got it right. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. Quadruple J falling from grace there. Janae moving up. Gen Y, Tosis, and Dr. P. They are going to stay put as we go to the next question. 11 players have reached a four-streak answer. They are on fire, as they say, in NBA Jam. That's right. Eight out of ten. A patient has right buttock occlusion and a weak right femoral pulse. The left femoral pulse is normal. Where is the blockage located? Patient right buttock occlusion and a weak right femoral pulse. The left femoral pulse, normal. Where is the blockage? Is the, the left common iliac, the right common iliac, the right internal iliac, or the right external iliac? Lock in your answer choices. Right buttock occlusion, weak right femoral pulse, left femoral pulse, normal. Where is that blockage? And let's find your answers. 45 of you getting that correct. Right common iliac. Walk us through this. We had 59 say right external. So let's let's think about this. If a patient has a right buttock occlusion, that's going to be the posterior branch off the internal iliac, not the external iliac. Okay, so the, the buttocks are going to be supplied with blood from the internal iliac, like I said. The external iliac is going to terminate or transition over into the femoral artery. Your left common iliac is not even going to be an issue in this one because the left femoral pulse is normal. So if you just by process of elimination, it's going to be the right common iliac. There we go. All right, right common iliac. Uh, let's take a look at the scoreboard, how they move. Quadruple J coming back. Uh, Zam, Janae, Gen Y, and Tosis round out the top handful as we come into a close on round number three. Nine out of ten. And here we go. Traumatic posterior dislocation of the femoral head can damage which important structure? Traumatic posterior dislocation. Is it ACL? Is it PCL? Is it femoral nerve or sciatic nerve? Traumatic posterior dislocation of the femoral head can damage which important structure? What do we think it is? ACL, PCL, femoral nerve or sciatic nerve? You're going to be hearing this game show music in your sleep. I promise. All right. And we have sciatic nerve is the answer. Now, walk us through ACL, PCL. Why not? Well, let's remember where the femoral head is. Okay. So the femoral head is up in your hip. So a traumatic posterior dislocation of the femoral head is going to most likely damage a hip structure or a gluteal structure. And that's the sciatic nerve. That's sciatic nerve. Yep. Got that right. All right, last question around number three. Quadruple J, Zam, Janae, Tosis, and uh, KTG round up the top five. Final question, round number three. A patient underwent jaw surgery and has an area of numbness inferior to the ramus of the mandible on the right chin. Why? Why does that patient have an area of numbness after jaw surgery? A damage to the facial nerve. Damage to the trigeminal nerve. And then the different uh, innervations, V3, V2, V1. What do you think it is? Underwent jaw surgery, an area of numbness inferior to the ramus of the mandible. Think location of the right chin. Why? Damage to facial nerve or trigeminal nerve, V3, V2, or V1. All right, V3, 103 of you got that absolutely correct. Walk us through this one. <laughs> Well, let's think about it. So if I have jaw surgery, okay, so I, you have to have a nerve that's going to go to my jaw, right? So if we think about where V1 is, V1 is going to be closer to my eye. V2 is going to be closer to my nose. The facial nerve is not going to innervate my jaw at all, right? Because we already talked about the facial nerve being a nerve that innervates muscles of facial expression. That literally only leaves V3. This was me in anatomy class going, yep, I remember one, two, three. There you that's go. That's exactly right. All right. 103 of you got it right. Let's see where we wrapped up. Clash of the Craniums. This is actually round three out of four. Zam with 10 out of 10, right? Janae, 9 out of 10. And number one. 
Quadruple J coming back to steal the podium by not many points. Look at that. 6, 8, uh, 6,883 to 6,902. Very close leaderboard there in round three out of four rounds here on Clash of the Craniums. All right, we are coming up on the final round of 10. We're going to go through these very, very quick. We're still seeing more than 120 of you. 121, almost 130 of you uh, with the broadcast. Would love to know feedback before you guys wrap up. Our goal is to do this again. What'd you like? What would you like to see more of? Probably dad jokes is my guess. I always well, love the dad jokes. Dad jokes and easier questions, right? Yeah. That's people shouting out their professors as well. You have I Alex. love it. I love it. All right, here comes the final round. All right, new Kahoot code. I'll put it in the chat as well. Kahoot.it or on the Kahoot app, 299-9200. 299 -9200. Getting shout outs for making this happen to you as well. Andrew says shout out to you for making this whole thing. And being the best in all caps. Well, Andrea, is, is this a current student? This is a current student. Just gunning for a better grade. Smart move, Andrea. <laughs> Smart move. Brilliant. They should know that flattery gets you nowhere with me. Flattery gets you everywhere, let's be honest here. <laughs> um, that code again, 299-9200 on the uh, Kahoot app or on Kahoot.it. Are the students coming up with a test? Do they have something coming up in your class anytime soon? Or what do they got? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to mention this, but they do have a final exam times two, a written what? exam and a lab exam, both on May 3rd in 18 days. Ah, you're fine. Put that off. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, fine. that's exactly what I don't want them to do. Fine. I got to give a shout out to my anatomy professor, Sky Donovan, and I will reveal... I think the lab practical, like when you give a practical, like it, was, it felt long. Like I was mentally exhausted by the time that was done. And I remember like wherever I stood, my last question was a bone. The bone was laying there and it literally said left or right. And it was a bone and I was mentally drained and I wrote uh, fibula. <laughs> she was like, that's not what I asked. And I was like, but what? Oh, never mind. She literally was like, I gave you a toss up left or right. And it was a fibula, and I wrote fibula. She was like, no, you're an idiot. All right, let's give it 10 more seconds before we start the final round of Clash of the Craniums. I'm not sure why I'm sort of slurring my S's and H's there. Uh, let's begin here. The Fly Rookies. We're, I, I like when people start changing up their names here. We're getting better. Jesus Christ is in the house. I like that. There we go. j Dog, M. Bill Gals, Preston. I never studied. Vegas... Britney Spears. All right, let's begin round number four. All right, here we go. Clash of the Craniums. It says round three. Trust me, it's round four. It's round four. It's round four. And here we go. Question one. Sensation from the skin on the back of his head is innervated by which nerve? Look at that. There it is right there. You should know. Sensation from the skin on the back of his head innervated by which nerve? Is it C2 dorsal ramus? C2 spinal nerve, C2 dorsal root, or C2 ventral root. We just talked about roots in a previous round. Did you pay attention? This stuff crosses over, guys. Three seconds left. Lock in your answer choices. Sensation on the back of the skin, innervated by C2 dorsal ramus. Why is it that one? Because a lot of people say dorsal root. How do you know? Well, let's let's think about where the dorsal root is, and let's think about where the dorsal ramus is, right? So, so my my rami, my dorsal rami, are going to provide innervation to my dorsal sections of my thorax, my dorsal sections of my cervical spine, my dorsal sections of the back of my head, as opposed to the dorsal root, which is going to then dive into and become part of the ramus with the motor branches. So it's the ramus. All right, close. <laughs> 
And the funny thing is, I'll be honest, when I was starting to answer stuff wrong, I remembered the stuff I got wrong and I didn't do it the second time. So getting it wrong isn't that big of a deal. Just don't that's, do it. That's learning. Britney Spears back on top of the charts. Uh, hit me, baby, one more time. Uh, Haley H, Nor'easter, G Money, and Nacho round out the top five as we go to question two in round number four. All the following can be found in the eighth intercostal space, except. Pay attention to these except questions. Uh, is the axons of the parasympathetic neurons? Is it somatic pain receptors? Axons of sympathetic neurons or ventral ramus of T8 spinal nerve? All the following can be found in the eighth intercostal space except. Marie is saying this is the most fun she's had in ages. Marie hasn't got out much. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I haven't got out much either. Oh, we've got answers here. Spread evenly. We got to talk about this one then. Uh, eighth intercostal space. All can be found there except. Walk us through this one. Where are the where are the pitfalls? So, so where the pitfall is is let's think about what my eighth intercostal space is going to have. Right? It's going to have some muscle. It's going to have some skin. It's going to have you know maybe a little bit of fascia. But what it's not going to have is parasympathetic neurons. Right? So, so read it really. really it's going to ha not have parasympathetic neurons because think about where parasympathetic neurons are. My parasympathetic nervous system comes from my vagus nerve. Those neurons are going to be up at cranial nerve 10. Tough one. That was a tough one. That was that was a tricky one. All right. Let's check the scoreboard there. Uh, Brittany Spears did not do well on that question. She falls completely off the charts. Uh, DA, Brittany Nay, Mville Gals, Andrea, and Aza J is uh, our, our leaders right now after question number two. Let's head to number three. A patient is unable to raise her arm over her fed following a mastectomy. Which nerve is most likely damaged? Unable to raise arm over head following a mastectomy. Which nerve most likely damaged? Long thoracic, thoracodorsal nerve, suprascapular nerve, or lower subscapular nerve? What do you think? 40 of you have already locked in your answer choices with 10 seconds to go. Unable to raise arm over head. Mastectomy, some giving clues there. Since we have two, one, time. Suprascapular nerve, uh, almost 80 of you got that right. Some people also thinking long thoracic. Why is it definitely not that one? Well, let's think about what the long thoracic nerve does. Long thoracic nerve is going to innervate serratus anterior. So serratus anterior would have been a nice second choice, but suprascapular nerve is going to innervate my supraspinatus, which is definitely going to help with things like reaching overhead because it really helps with shoulder abduction. Suprascapular nerve, important overhead. That was question three. Let's check out uh, how we did there. Shifting some scores. Nacho, Big Mac, Andrea, Trash Knees, and DA round out the top five here in round four out of four. Let's take a look at question number four. Which statement best describes the cauda equina? It's composed of lumbar spinal nerves. It represents the caudal extension of the spinal cord. It's comp uh, composed of lower lumbar, sacral dorsal, and ventral rami. Or it's composed of lower lumbar and sacral dorsal and ventral roots. Describe the cauda equina. Lock in your answer choices with three seconds left. And we have... Wow, this is a tough one. 61 fell for that B. It represents the caudal extension of the spinal cord. I'll be honest, I think I was going to go that direction too. Yeah, and you know that would have been a good second choice, but let's think about what the caudal equina is. You know, caudal equina means horse's tail, right? So, so the caudal extension of the spinal cord is actually going to be the phylum terminale. I remember that. I know you did. I have faith in you, Jimmy. I mean, it was there. Uh, Sean Murphy, Nacho, Big Mac, Andrea, and Haley H. on the uh, on the leaderboard right now. Coming up on the halfway mark in round number four, the terminal branches of the left coronary artery are the anterior and posterior intraventricular arteries, anterior intraventricular and circumflex arteries superior and inferior infra interventricular arteries or medial and lateral interventricular arteries 
The terminal branches of the left coronary uh, artery are lock in your answer choices with five seconds left. And our answers are 84 of you. Now we're starting to get back to uh, answering in unison. Anterior, interventricular, and circumflex arteries located in the terminal branch of the left coronary artery. I, I feel confident, feel good there as people start to answer correctly. Oh, absolutely. I think it was really well done on that one. Uh, Sean going on fire, answering a bunch in a row. Big Mac, Trash Knees, Andrea, and D.A. As we're past the halfway point in the final round of the Clash of the Craniums, which of the following hip adductors is not innervated by the obturator nerve? Not innervated by the obturator nerve. Is it gracilis, adductor longus, pectineus, or adductor brevis? What do you think? Which of the following hip adductors not innervated? by that obturator nerve with five seconds left to lock in your answer choice. And there we go. 57 of you getting that correct, knowing that pectineus not innervated by the obturator nerve. Uh, pectineus innervated by what? The femoral nerve. Femoral nerve. All right. Question number seven is on the way. Let's take a look at how things are shaking up on the leaderboard. Sean's still holding the top spot. Haley, Trash Knees, Day, and Dr. Lewis. Coming in at the five spot. Question seven. Which of the following arteries anastomoses with the inferior ulnar collateral artery? Is it posterior ulnar recurrent artery, anterior ulnar recurrent artery, radial recurrent artery, or interosseous recurrent artery? Lock in your answer choices with five seconds left. And there we go. This one split across the board, almost flat. Walk us through this one. So the inferior ulnar collateral artery is going to anastomos with the anterior ulnar recurrent artery. And reason is because you really have to kind of think about ulnar and ulnar are going to go together. Interosseous is just going to mean between bones. And it can't be a radial recurrent because that's going to be on the radial side. So process of elimination. All right. Sounds good. As we are done with number seven, we take a look at the board with just a few questions left. Dr. Lewis jumps to the top. Uh, DA, Sean Murphy, still on the, uh, the board. KTG and Big Mac. Question eight of 10, the final round, which of the following is not an upward rotator of the scapula? Which the following not an upward rotator of the scapula? Is it lower trapezius, upper trapezius, levator scap, or serratus anterior? Which not an upward rotator of the scapula? What do you think? Let's see what you put. Wow, this one spread to uh, 46 of you getting it right, levator scap, but a lot of people thinking lower trapezius. Walk us through this one, Matt. Well, levator scapula is going to be a downward rotator of the scapula. So lower trap, believe it or not, because of its attachment points, actually assists with upward rotation of the scapula. Good reveal. That was question eight as we check the scoreboard. Big changes here. Haley coming into the top spot. Case challenge. Dr. Lewis, Andrea, and AWAM. Two questions remain here in the final round of Clash of the Craniums. And here we go. Which of the following muscles didn't, does not directly attach to a bone? This one sounds like it would be a fun party question. Which of the following muscles does not directly attach to a bone? Uh, is it opponent's pollicis? Is it the lumbricals? Is it dorsal interossei uh, inter or palmar interossei? What do you think? 
Matt, do you have any weird anatomical features on yourself? I feel like that comes up a lot in anatomy class. You know, I do. So my left radial nerve, I'm sorry, my left radial artery is not located where it should be. It's actually located all the way on the lateral side of my radius. So People. I'm a I'm a terrible person to have in practical examinations when students try to take my pulse because they can never find it. People are weird. All right, following muscles does not directly attach to bone lumbricals. It's just a weird muscle. It's a weird muscle. It does a weird thing, and it has a weird attachment, right? I agree. All right, let's uh, check this, the, the shakedown here. Haley H. remains there. Uh, Sean, A-W-A-M, D-A, and Katie G. round out the top five. Final question. Final uh, of the final round tonight coming up now. Which of the following arteries provides blood to the knee? Is it ascending branch of lateral femoral circumflex, descending branch of lateral femoral circumflex, ascending branch of medial femoral circumflex, or descending branch of medial femoral circumflex? Uh, Matt, fun fact, uh, uvulas, you know where those are located? Yes. Usually you use the singular when you say uvulas, except I've got two of them. Whoa. Yeah, I'm a weirdo. How, how have you made it this far? I don't know. Just keep going. All right, what do we think it is? Following arteries provide blood to the knee... Descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex, 42. Uh, 50 thought it was descending branch of medial femoral circumflex. Why is it not that? So let's think about where the medial femoral circumflex artery is going to go. It's going to go to the medial femur, right? So it's going to hit the head of the femur, the neck of the femur, and then it's going to kind of wrap around to the posterior aspect of the femur. The descending branch to the lateral femoral circumflex is going to stay lateral, and it actually goes all the way down, and anastomosis is in with the geniculate arteries. I like it. Let's take a look at how this round shook down. Clash of the Cranium's final round of four tonight in third with 7 out of 10. Andrea... 7 out of 10, Sean Murphy. And with 8 out of 10, 55, 80 points, Haley H. Is the champion of the final round. Matt, how'd this go? I was impressed with everybody. I thought it went fantastic. I was really impressed with everyone's knowledge. And um, I really appreciate everyone showing up. Yeah, we're seeing some uh, some pretty cool stuff in the uh, the chat. People saying it was a great review. Uh, apologies, uh, there was a little bit of a lag. We're gonna we're gonna take a look into this. Really, this was us kind of flinging stuff against the wall and giving it a shot. Uh, and we'll work on it. I think with more than a hundred, you guys still tuned in after an hour of anatomy review. Uh, Marie having the best night of her life. Wow, bar is <laughs> low on this one. You're welcome. It's the first time anybody's ever told me that. I like that. I yeah, me too. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to echo Jimmy. Lots of feedback on this, guys. Please, you know, I mean, we're both on Twitter. You know, everybody has my email. Please reach out and tell us what was good and what was bad and what you would want to see next. Yeah, we're definitely going to work on uh, on Malak, see if we can figure that one out, make it a little bit better. Uh, we want to make sure the user experience is good. But, of course, content as well. I'm sure we could probably do some theme nights and things like that. Uh, but uh, once more, thanks so much for tuning in Clash of the Craniums. Uh, we're going to try to figure out how we can reach out to the, uh, the round winners. And then, I guess, the, the ultimate overall winner. We'll take a look at all the points and how things shook down across all four uh, rounds. And we'll announce it on Twitter sometime either tomorrow or this weekend on who the original winner of the clash of the craniums is absolutely and uh keely is asking if we recorded it it will remain on this youtube channel as a video for you to play along with i don't know if you want to watch us in replay but absolutely you could you could completely do that and watch this uh, on this youtube channel so it could be the same link well that's fantastic and keely this brings me back to lecture because you guys are usually get on me to hit the record button on lecture too right oh i'm getting that's an inside joke got it she's, <laughs> she's uh i'm picking up what she's putting down there uh, show the femur. We, uh, we, we're going to have a, a picture of that online tomorrow. It's out in your garage, right? It's, it's out in my garage right now. Out in your garage right now. Thank you, Keely. I, I completely fell into the Zoom, the Zoom joke. Perfect. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for coming to the first ever. If you enjoyed it, uh, tell a friend, hit that like and subscribe button to let us know. And hopefully we have you back for the second Clash of the Craniums. Thanks so much. Bye, guys.